We have um, two extraordinary guests here. I'm going to ask them to come up for me, with me now. Um, uh, Mark Bertolini is the CEO of Aetna. And um, I'm going to sit down in a second and, and uh, say a couple more words. And uh, uh, Peter Orzag is the former director of OMB and CBO and had a major hand in the, uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, the legislation. I, I'm, I'm, I'm told uh, that calling it Obamacare is now okay. Initially it wasn't, but so I'll just call it, it's Obamacare. Uh, so uh, with that, we have a terrific um, uh, opportunity here. Let me get my, the iPad so I can get your questions. Uh, for you to ask some uh, questions of of these two architects, and I'm going to refer to them as architects because uh, this really is uh, architecture of the payment system in healthcare. And these are very complicated buildings. The payment system in healthcare is, is very complex. You heard Atul Gawande say that there are uh, 60,000 plus pathologies of human organs that have been documented. The systems necessary to address those 60,000 plus pathologies are themselves quite complicated and multifold. And then how do you design, and here's the design, the architecture part, a payment system that is going to give us the best in the delivery system and simultaneously give us the most in innovation? I think that's what this conference is about. Innovation, sustaining innovation, but we've got to do it in a way that uh, preserves the ability of our, our healthcare system to pay for this. I will say that uh, personally in, in the provider community, it was um, uh, Peter Orzag's uh, paper in the New England Journal that was so instrumental in the country for helping providers, the healthcare providers, understand we are part of the problem we have to be part of the solution. It, it was his statement of the economics of the situation, the debt and uh, uh, burden created by healthcare cost inflation. So here we are with two great architects. Um, Mark, uh, just we're gonna start off on a personal note so our audience can, can get to know uh, both of you a little bit. Um, I noticed in my Google search of you that you have a, um, an interest in guide dogs. Um, it turns out uh, my daughter is a freshman in college. Uh, she's part of a club that trains puppies in the first phase of guide dog mm -hmm. um, uh, training. And she said it's the best part of college. Uh, t <laughs> taking puppies to classes to makes money. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right. That's right. But taking puppies to classes for is great. <laughs> right. um, so, um, so Mark, could you tell us a little bit about um, a personal view into healthcare delivery and innovation? Sure. Um, I, um, I'm a spinal cord injury survivor. I'm C2, C3, C4, C5, and T1 fractures. Um, macerated brachial plexus, C7, C8 nerve root avulsion. Uh, and I'm walking and talking. Um, I have the latest Medtronic spinal cord neurostimulator in my brain to control my pain. Uh, and I luckily fell into a stream of water, uh, and laid there for two hours in the cold. I was extreme skiing, um, and it froze my spinal cord, and it prevented it from swelling and saved my life, and that's why I'm here today. So, <clears throat> you know, a little bit of accident, a little bit of technology. Um, I, I have a, sh a fused left shoulder, so it's all um, part of um, um, a, um, a miracle of science, right? And, and yet, um, while I have all these incredible capabilities, wired in me and, and connecting me and, and making me functional. Um, I still ski, ride motorcycles, and just road bike the Camino de Santiago across Spain and France last summer. Um, I still had to find my own journey to manage my pain and get my life back. Um, because there wasn't anybody who could say, how do we take this person that resulted from this injury and these procedures and get that person back to their full functioning of life? And so for us, in my family and for me as a leader of a company, we're refocusing on how do we create productive individuals who then for, are healthy, who are productive, who are economically viable and happy. That should be our definition of a fully functioning healthcare system. And unfortunately, we focus on just fixing what's wrong and not what to do afterwards. 
And, and so my own personal dream, my son was also had T-cell gamma delta lymphoma, only survivor of it, thanks to the folks at, at uh, Brigham and at, uh, at Children's Hospital. Um, again, science at its very highest form, but once his cancer was gone, his nutritional deficits and all the things he had to deal with, his loss of his kidneys, I gave him my left kidney in 2007, all of that stuff had to be done afterwards and had to be figured out. And so I think our system really isn't a system. We fix broken things. We don't build healthy, productive, viable, and happy people. Mark, thanks. Peter, personal view, innovation and healthcare delivery. Well, I, I don't have anything nearly as dramatic as Mark's experience, um, but it, I'm an economist by training, and uh, I didn't, frankly, pay very much attention to health or healthcare until my mid-30s. In fact, my general healthcare personal strategy was to take out larger and larger term life insurance policies on myself, have a doctor come out, inspect me, make sure I wasn't about to die, and I figured I was fine. Um, at some point, someone <laughs> pointed out that may not be the optimal uh, personal health care strategy. So I went to a primary care physician who tested lots of other things that the uh, life insurance docs were not uh, testing, uh, and along a whole variety of dimensions, um, got a severe wake-up call um, for things that they were not testing that were uh, much worse than one might would have thought because I kind of looked healthy. So that happened at the same time that I got very frustrated with a lot of lunchtime discussions at Brookings, which typically went like, yes, we know that Medicare and Medicaid are the core long-term fiscal problem, but we don't really know what to do about them, so let's talk about Social Security. Uh, and it was the confluence of kind of a personal wake-up call and uh, uh, professional frustration with um, punting on the bigger problem that really drove my, my interest in healthcare and innovation. Terrific. So let's start from the beginning. So you've both said that the payment system is the problem. Could you expand on that a little bit for our audience? Why exactly is the payment system the source of the problem? So we have a 2.7 trillion economic industry, right? This massive organization throughout the United States. It's really run like a cottage industry. We have physicians who work on the basis of cash flow. We have hospitals that work on a revenue basis and we have insurance companies that work on a margin basis. And yet we expect the three to cooperate together economically to make a functioning healthcare system. There couldn't be anything more disconnected. So the idea is how do we get everybody to function under one economic model, which then should be incented to drive the ultimate result, which is a set of healthy individuals who are productive, viable, and happy and create better communities and thriving communities. So the healthcare system should be a driver of the economy, not necessarily a cost, part of the cost structure of an economy, a burden on the economy, a drag on the economy. So it's this idea of how do we set the right economic model, everybody on the same economic model, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm open to any discussion about what that might be, anything but fee for service, um, I would say. Um, I would even go as far as a budget with a single payer. Um, but it has to be a single economic model that rewards people for this outcome and everybody has to be on the same economic basis. Peter? I, I get, it seems pretty simple to me as an economist. If you pay for quantity, you're gonna get quantity. And that's what a fee-for-service system does. You pay for how much stuff is done and you wind up with a lot of stuff. Uh, so the challenge is, and by the way, those who doubt, I mean, I, I have absolutely no doubt that most people who enter uh, healthcare and medicine uh, do it for um, high, high-minded purposes. But if anyone continues to doubt that the payment model matters, there just is example after example after example, the most uh, you know, dramatic of which involves moving the DRG payments for hospitals in the early 1980s, where you change the payment system and big things move as a result. I'd also say the reduction in readmission rates that we've seen recently is by actual and anticipated changes in, uh, in the financial returns to doing that. So it's a combination of that uh, high-minded purpose and I mean I guess the way I would put it is it's asking a lot of a doctor or hospital to do the right thing when it costs them a ton of money uh, and the incentives are 
in exactly the contrary way. So re uh, readmissions are perhaps the best example. Why, do, why were we stuck at about 19 or 20 percent readmission rates for Medicare beneficiaries for 30-day readmits uh, when the evidence now shows we can do a lot better and we knew that beforehand because there were places in the country that were doing a lot better. And the answer, I think, is that if you succeeded in reducing your readmission rate, you were killing yourself in terms of your revenue flow. We paid basically for every readmit. So that's an example of a payment structure that doesn't work. And I think the grand challenge is we, um, this, this uh, gathering heard from Secretary Burwell yesterday, I think the grand challenge is I think it's great that she set goals of 30% of Medicare payments being uh, value-based by 2016, 50% by 2018. Um, the great challenge is exactly what mode do we choose? Is it ACO 3.0? Is it uh, bundled payments cascaded out? Exactly how is this structure now that we've got some goals in place? How do we deliver on that? Great. Well, then uh, let's let's move to that. So. Um, uh, so we did hear uh, from Secretary Burwell yesterday uh, that, that the, the government as a payer is moving toward value-based purchasing. Um, and, and the government as a payer, uh, if you combine Medicare and Medicaid, they are 50%. They're basically half of dollars spent in health care would be uh, uh, the government as, as payer. So um, what is, and, and I'll start with you this time, Peter, what is the approach here that we should be taking? Well, as in the ACA, the approach that we took was not knowing exactly which models will turn out, would turn out to be the most successful. It was a little, I mean, and this was some of the commentary, it was a little bit of spaghetti against the wall. Let's try, let's try bundled payments, let's try ACOs, let, let's experiment here with a more rapid feedback loop so that as something looks promising, you can move to scale um, and that's one of the uh, most important parts of the legislation, in my opinion. Secretary Burwell, at this point, if she has the actuaries confirm that a, um, one of the innovations that were tested out through the Innovation Center is working, and you can, uh, we can get into the details of what that means, can move to nationwide policy implementation without new legislation. And I think that's important because um, that was sort of the whole thought process here, is we wouldn't know exactly what was what, how it was going to work out. Um, we have seen problems that have emerged in many of the ACO models, and so I think it's wise that those were not locked into uh, hard line, you know, hard coded into legislation, but were allowed to adapt and evolve a little bit. Um, and at this point, I think the grand question is the one that I asked. Should we be um, asking providers to take the grand leap over the, um, the valley into a, a basically a capitated type world with uh, ACOs? Um, or should we be starting with different bundles and cascading them out over a uh, wider and wider number of conditions and episodes and get to kind of universal value-based payment that way as opposed to on the per capita way? I think that's an open question, but it is a question that needs to be addressed within the next couple of years because we are rapidly reaching the point where from the provider perspective, the one foot on the dock and one foot on the boat problem of not knowing where we're going is becoming severe, and we need to provide some clarity about that. Mark, on the commercial side, mm -hmm. um, uh, and I'm going to pick up on something Peter just said, um, the word capitation. So um, uh, I, uh, I actually was practicing medicine in the mid-90s when um, capitation was the solution to the healthcare cost problem. And I bet you that it didn't work really well for you then. You know, yeah. it, it <laughs> didn't. And most of the people who are my age or older remember that, yeah. and they say, Tim, that doesn't work. Why, how is this different than the last time we tried this? Right, so um, we don't use the word capitation. <laughs> yeah, anymore. that's a good start. <laughs> Back in the early 90s, I used to deliver the capitation checks. It was, you know, this high of green bar with a rubber band around both sides and a check underneath it, and it was the patient's name, social security number, member number, and the amount. So here's your capitation report, and that's all the information you had. So it's a wonder um, you didn't fail sooner, actually. Um, I think, I think this idea that government and commercial are different is, not, is, is a mistake of how we think about running the system. Um, I can tell you that whenever CMS makes a decision about payment schedules, the industry gets advantaged by it on the commercial side, but by accident. 
So whenever Congress would fix the SGR and not reduce fees by 10%, we would reduce our fee schedules for the next year because we knew we didn't make up, need to make up for that. So but we all you're acknowledging this cross-subsidy that people Oh yeah, there's about. definitely a cross-subsidy, both yeah. ways. Yeah. And when CMS would put in never events, we would put in never events. And so I'll take everybody back to 1983. Bed days per thousand in 1983 peaked at 750 bed days per thousand in the United States. That was the average number of bed days per thousand. That means that three quarters of an American spent one day in the hospital every year. And now we're below 200. What happened in 1983? DRGs. We changed the payment system all at once. And we said, you're gonna get paid once. And so all the payers followed and changed it. So my conversation with Secretary Burwell has been, why don't we do this together? That way we have 100% of the system. Let's figure out the path, whether it's bundled payments over time or going to you know, all in, all at once. Let's do it all together so that we can have this impact on the economics of the system. People will change pretty quickly. It happened very quickly in 1983 after we changed the way we reimbursed inpatient admissions. So I think that has to happen, um, number one. Number two, if you haven't noticed, utilization's been low. And utilization's been low because people are spending money out of pocket, and the consumer now is ever more present in the whole debate about healthcare. And they're, ta and they're thinking about how they spend their money. And so they're coming too with their own view of what they ought to pay for and what they shouldn't pay for. And a lot more people are paying more out of pocket. Currently today, 41% of, of people's healthcare costs are paid out of pocket. Dentistry, 70%. Dentists went away. 10 years ago, or 20 years ago for the most part, until they got into cosmetic dentistry. And now you lock your wallet in the trunk of the car before you go in because <laughs> they're gonna sell you veneers and we're gonna fix this tooth and that tooth because it's cash and carry. Are we ready for consumers who are gonna have an impact on the system? That's the other vector coming in on this payment. In the future, people will have a voucher from their government or a voucher from their employer and they're gonna buy their health care from a system. Are you ready? You know, can I just, uh, to, because uh, we get this question all the time of what's different in terms of this wave as opposed to the 19, and I'd say there are two other differences in addition to, to the increased role of the consumer and the other um, points that Mark made. Uh, one is that uh, the data resources are significantly mm -hmm. better, the analytics are better, that's the whole point. When it's crude, you get much, a much more severe backlash than when it's uh, more nuanced and only with the data and the analytics can it be more nuanced, that's one thing. Um, the second thing is uh, we're, we're, on, we're possibly going to experience an interesting shift from the gatekeeper being Mark to the gatekeeper being you. So if, you're, if, you're, if, if Partners or Mass General takes, uh, you know, a, I won't call it capitated, a per person. Uh, a global payment. A global payment, thank you. A global payment per person. Um, uh, and then you'll have to decide, or uh, torture, someone has to decide whether the new device, the new drug, the new this, the new that is worth it or not. And that it's, a, it's an interesting change because patients are used to doctors saying, you should do X, oh, I'm so sorry, your insurance company won't cover it. Tran you know, move forward 10 years, does that become the doctor saying, I don't think you need this, and the patient saying, well, hold on a second, are you saying I don't need it because I don't need it or because you get more money if I don't get it? And we're, we're, that's far down the road, but to the extent that that decision-making locus changes, um, a lot of other changes follow, including how device and drug manufacturers have to sell their products. I, I wonder if, if that was on uh, Dr. Torchiana's um, uh, job description when he took the CEO <laughs> job for, uh, for Partners Healthcare. Uh, making decisions about um, what what kind of tech, new technologies we'll, we will be deploying in the future. To follow up on that point, um, uh, so the, Peter, the ACA legislation has been criticized for many the potential for <laughs> <laughs> for many things. Um, but one of the most relevant, I think, to this audience is its potential to squelch innovation. Um, and uh, could could you uh, uh, address that? Yeah, so uh, that certainly is not the intention. Um, I hope it's not the unintended consequence. I'm gonna come back to, uh, I saw only a little bit of a tools presentation, 
But the core challenge is the following. Everyone should acknowledge that on average, um, new technologies have been way more than worth it in terms of the improvement in health that they have produced over the past five decades. And that's what the academic literature suggests. It's also what common sense suggests because anyone in this room who would want to go back to 1940s medicine at the inflation adjusted prices would be nuts in my opinion. Um, so on average, it's been worth it. The problem is that the evidence suggests that a significant share of what we spend at the margin is not worth it. And so how do you then get rid of the waste while keeping the good part? And the evidence for that, I think, is um, quite compelling at this point. I mean, uh, for example, there's been this uh, uh, dramatic debate over the Dartmouth um, data on Medicare and whether that variation, at, at least at the geographic level, I won't talk about in individual institutions, but at the geographic level, reflected different practice norms or the underlying health of the population in different areas. And so a recent study by Amy Finkelstein here at MIT and some co-authors, I think pretty definitively answered that question by examining what happens when people move from one area to the other. And if you move from Florida to Minnesota or vice versa, and the variation in the spending levels was just because of your health status, then how much is spent on you should not change when you move. And instead, what you see is very dramatic changes in both directions, up and down, depending on the direction of the move, equal to about half of the difference in the means between the high spending region and the low spending region. So unless you think that someone who's living in Florida who all of a sudden feels healthy says, oh, I have a great idea, why don't I move to Minnesota? doesn't seem plausible, um, <laughs> that, that is providing a pretty good, and there's a, there's a lot of other evidence from, for example, from the variation in where people are sent based on where they live and the ambulance referral um, district that they happen to, you know, what side of the street they happen to live on, that a lot of the variation that we see in healthcare costs is not correlated with outcomes or quality. So the key question is, how can you do a better job without harming the incentives for innovation? And this partly comes back to what we were just discussing, which is um, for, the, for the folks who are at providers in the room, I mean, presumably one of the ways that you do that is you invest more authority in someone like Tim Ferriss to decide whether the new technology is worth it or not um, to pay for, you know, in terms of the cost quality trade-off. So I think the underlying goal here is to continue to create incentives for innovation, but for, quote, the right kind of innovation that is where the incentive is for value and not just more stuff. It's easy to say, it's very hard to do, and that's why this is uh, art, not science. Terrific. Mark, you've been, you've taken Aetna um, in, a, in, a, been in a very uh, thoughtful and vanguard way into this issue of transparency. Um, could, could you say a, a, a little bit, I know you've, you're on record as, as being for transparency. Right. What does that mean and how does that play into this, um, uh, this matrix of decision making around the changes in the payment system? Well, it's about how do you um, help people make better decisions is really the bottom line. Um, because if you improve the decision making, you'll improve the quality of the outcome and the result will be lower cost, um, not the other way around. And, and, and so the level of transparency needs to be where it matters. So we sort of look at the world as we have some consumers and then we have really patients. When I you know, hit that tree at a very high rate of speed on my skis and I was in a coma and they were medevacing me to Dartmouth-Hitchcock, I was not a consumer of healthcare. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was not looking at eye triage and saying, geez, where should I go? <laughs> what should I expect? How much is this gonna cost me? because I blew through my deductible and my out-of-pocket costs in the helicopter right. on my way there. So <laughs> this was not going to be you know, a cheap event. And, and so in that case, we don't need consumers with transparency of information. Mm -hmm. What we need are individuals working in teams making sure that person gets well, gets to their highest level of functioning. So my optimal state of health after my accident is far different than my optimal state beforehand. My lifestyle's changed, all sorts of things have changed, but I'm still at the optimal level of my health given the injuries and the things I had to sustain and live with. So that's, that's the patient, right? So they need to be treated differently. And quite frankly, the system is you know, still sloppy around the edges, still wastes money on the margin. Top 5% of Medicare consume 42% of Medicare spend. Um, on average, 10 doctors each, 25 prescriptions each. 
something's not right there. So we got an, a lot of opportunity at that end. But on the other end, on the consumer end, there's a lot of stuff that's commoditized. Mm -hmm. I really don't inspect or have a conversation with my phlebotomist before he or she draws my blood. Mm -hmm. You know, can they, sh get, can they hit the vein? And I got really good ones, so I don't ever worry about it. Can they hit the vein, can they get the blood out, can they test it, or can we just do it with a finger prick? Mm -hmm. And do I need to get all this other blood work done? Yet, because you get a CBC at a high cost, high quality institution, the cost of that CBC is fundamentally different than you can get it at CVS. And so for consumers, there's an opportunity for them to make better decisions there. Uh, and that's the technology we've developed. And so we now have a tool called WellMatch, which allows us to buy excess capacity in the system on a spot market rate basis and offer it to individuals on their way home from work on their way to pick up the kids so that the healthcare system works for them. They don't have to work to fit themselves into the schedule. If you've ever been to a local lab, name unknown, um, where you have to sit, or if you don't show up with an appointment, you sit there for hours, right? That shouldn't be the case because that is a commodity, that blood test. And so we, so we have to look at the world and, and the way people are approaching the system, how they're coming into the system, and there's a lot we can do with transparency around that. Uh, making that happen, and, and, and that's where we've invested our money. Do you want to, um, I want to follow up with that just a, a little bit with um, your work with the Healthcare Costs Institute. Do you want to yeah. uh, talk about that a little bit? Because I think it's pretty revolutionary. For a long, long time, the industry has felt that information that we had, as rudimentary and crude as it was, and quite frankly it was, that um, it was something that we, was proprietary to us, and that if we protected it, we could therefore um, make sure that we were continue to be successful because we would have information nobody else had. And quite frankly, a lot of you in the audience feel the same way as providers for a long time that the information you have in medical records, proprietary belongs to us, it's about us. Um, sometimes it's a legal issue, but other times it's really, you know, what do we do to make sure we keep our patients? Because right? they gotta come here to get their information. So with HCCI, what we've done, um, Aetna's done a couple of things, but as an industry, we've done a few more. So Aetna now has the largest health information exchange called Medicity. It wires over 1,000 hospitals and over 270,000 physicians in the United States. We collected a billion clinical transactions, 270 terabytes of data last year alone. We're the largest installed health information exchange. We power Colorado, we power Michigan, we power a lot of states. And so that data is data that can be useful in the right hands. Um, with HCCI, it's all the claims data, and that's an industry-wide coalition which says we shouldn't hide this information. There should be complete transparency on where it is to get the most convenient, cheapest blood test right now, where it is to get the cheapest imaging. We now know that we can buy imaging at a 40% discount at midnight anywhere. Now, who wants imaging at midnight for a discount? A lot of people. How about women with suspected breast cancer or people with other cancers that have to wait two weeks to get it during the normal course of business hours and they wanna know now? So there's a huge opportunity to offer those kinds of services through this technology. So we've decided to let the information go and let everybody have access to it and let everybody use it in a way that can best advantage them personally. Terrific. Peter, you're on the hook again. Okay. One of the, uh, uh, another criticism of the ACA legislation is the, and I'll, I'll, I'll state this in conceptual terms, uh, so the providers of healthcare are, are very heterogeneous out there, right? And uh, there are some focus factories that deliver one thing and deliver that thing really well, and our Harvard Business School colleagues would say, actually, there should be a lot more of that in medicine. But typically, those focus factories don't deliver on the things that the fee schedule undervalues but are necessary in, in our system, like pediatric psychiatry, um, uh, a, a whole slew of neurologic conditions. Um, and so there are providers who provide care for, for the whole and not just the, the focus factory. And that, that's just one dimension on which there's heterogeneity. How do you approach writing regulations around uh, uh, the payment system for healthcare when the impact of those regulations 
is going to be very different. It's going to it's it's not going to be the same on each of those types of providers. And you you want to be fair. So how how does uh, um, what well is I it? start from the um, from the sort of my starting base is that a lot of those biases ar arise in a, a payment world in Medicare that. I mean, let me put it this way. Do you really want the Senate Finance Committee and the House Ways and Means Committee deciding those issues? Right. So yep. and I don't either. <laughs> and so uh, the, the system that we have is a reflection of uh, partly it's kind of the technical piece, but it's also partly the political piece. And it's interaction between the two that produces the results of Medicare payment as we know it. Um, if you don't love that, then the question is, do you try to continue to you know, uh, nibble at the edges of, of adjusting a little bit this way or a little bit that way, or do you change the model so that, for example, if there is a service that is undervalued today, but that is actually quite valuable um, in, a, in any of the, well, not in the bundle payment, but any of the other um, global payment models, uh, medical home or an ACO or what have you, there is a different decision maker who then decides whether that service is worth it or not, and that person, that usually doctor or medical professional, is going to be better positioned to evaluate whether that service is valuable or not than a staff member at the Senate Finance Committee. That's, I think, the fundamental point. Can I offer an example? Yes, please. So I think bundled payments or global payments can work in this way to create the right incentives. So we did an experiment with congestive heart failure readmissions. And instead of saying to the patient, get on a scale every morning, measure your weight, do some math, tell us if it goes out of tolerance, call us if it does, we'll get back to you. What we did is we gave the patient a Bluetooth technology in their scale, and we gave them their pills. And we said, when you get up in the morning, eat these, stand on that, you don't need to do anything else. We'll watch the weight change, we'll just take your pills, stand on the machine. Take your pills, stand on the machine. And we had people that we set up a, a telemetry that watched this happen every day. And whenever it would happen, we'd send a nurse out on our own nickel. Are they taking their pills? If not, educate them on how to take them. If they are taking their pills, call the doctor, get them updated. Oh, by the way, on the way out the door, roll up the rugs because they shuffle when they walk, they fall and break a hip. In six months, we reduced congestive heart failure readmissions by 49%. What were the most important pieces in there? Was it the physician? No. It was the Bluetooth technology and it was the nurse, and both of those were free for the patient. We didn't bill anybody for them. And how long do we think it would have taken Medicare to pay for Bluetooth scales forever, right? It was right. not gonna happen within our So lifetime. it doesn't work, that, so, and now what we're doing <laughs> with Medtronic is we're looking at, arteri we're looking at um, vessel impedance in the pacemakers and the data coming out of the pacemakers, and if the impedance goes up, we're looking for water weight gain before it happens. So why shouldn't we be, this stuff should all be free. The cheapest place to provide care is in the home. The cheapest person to provide it is the family. And if we give them the tools and the capabilities and we bring stuff to the home, then there's more than enough stuff left in the system to be able to provide all the important and hands-on care. And so it needs to be a team-based model where a lot of this stuff is just free for people. So I have a, a long list of questions coming in and I'm trying to hit them. and I, if I haven't hit your question exactly, it's because I'm actually trying to push them together. Um, but here's one um, uh, that comes off of the, the cheapest imaging. Um, so what if I want to find the, the cheapest imaging now? Um, but it's not just a late night image. Um, it's a suburban for-profit company. Um, is, is it just about price or is it about it says, uh, then I go to the uh, MGH doctor that says, um, I actually need to see the image, so it's actually better to have it done here. So is price, I, I, I'm gonna read from this, that right. is price the only consideration? No, it's not. Obviously, people need to make, meet a minimum level of capability. I know, by the way, you can move images around. Right. <laughs> you know, I carry my MRI images and all of my images of my neck and my spine and with me wherever I go. Yeah. Um, and it, it's on my phone. Yeah. So when, when a doctor says, geez, it's gonna be really hard for me to get the information, um, I say, well, what's your email address? And they go, well, <laughs> it's called secure email, works really well, I can send it to you. And so we don't, so the image can go wherever it needs to be and be with the person that it needs to be with at any given moment. Technology is not a problem. 
It's the willingness of people to share the information and move the information around that is. And so I would argue that it's about getting the image as quickly as possible, peace of mind maybe, right? Wouldn't it be nice if I had somebody looking at it and then getting the image to the person that needs to look at it? But it doesn't need to have to be all done in the same place. Um, I, I just, you know, I think that's, that, that, that doesn't solve the problem. Great, so Peter, now I'm gonna follow up uh, something that you said with a question. So, and this is a, a great question because it, it's uh, emblematic of the difficulty of understanding what global payments uh, are. So if the nurse and Bluetooth, well, I guess this was your exa example, Mark, um, is free to the patient, nothing's free. I, I'm a doctor, but I did learn that in, in high school economics. So, um, uh, so, uh, <coughs> so who pays for it? Someone under a global payment system and you, let's just say, for example, right. Aetna does not pay for Bluetooth technology. Yeah, we Ma did. Maybe it, well, okay. We but, did. So CMS doesn't. Um, right. That but, was my point, right. right. Right, and so that was your point. So who's under a global payment? Who's making the decision to pay for it? And, and where are they getting Can, the money from? A brief, a brief um, lesson in actuarial science, okay? Um, Good, that hits another in question. In the old <laughs> days, in the old days, I always wanted to be an actuary, they won't let me. Um, I'm way too risk taking. Um, but in the old days, what we used to do is create balanced risk pools and we tried to make the pool as, as homogenous and safe as possible to put a price over all of it. And that was the way we ran the health insurance industry. And what we did is try to control the use. It's called utilization controls, right? Utilization management. Now what's happened is, is if you get paid for the risk and you actually know what you're doing, you should be willing to take it. So what happened with Medicare Advantage by CMS back in 2005 is they said, how do we get you health plans to actually take the sick people? So pay us for the risk. So we put together a risk adjuster model and we started taking care of patients under the risk adjuster model. And this is the dirty little secret for all you providers out there. If you actually get paid for this risk and you manage them really well, there's far more margin in a Medicare, a 73-year-old, 75-year-old Medicare Advantage patient with three comorbidities is four times more profitable than a healthy 24-year-old who ever uses their health care. Because all you have to do is manage them. They're unmanaged in the fee-for-service model. They get bounced around. So if you, and, and we provide them with a nurse, we stick a nurse to them. We say, just follow this person around. We give them all the technology they need, all on our nickel, because at $1,200 a month versus $300 a month for a healthy 24-year-old, if we save 10%, by just managing that care more effectively, that's four times more profitable than that 24-year-old never using the healthcare system. That's a global payment. That's how Medicare Advantage pays health plans. And with the providers we're working with on Medicare Advantage, we're, we said, Psst, let me show you a watch. This is how it works. <laughs> and we said, what we're gonna do is we're gonna let you in on this revenue model. Now you have to take care of the patient, you have to manage them, you have to put case managers on them, you have to find the right doctors who are willing to work in a team-based environment and not have the patient come back every week. They can get all this all can be done in the home. And so we now as an industry compete for sick Medicare advantage, Medicare enrollees. So we can manage them. So now let me And take it's by improving quality we make money. You wanted to say Yeah, something. I want to say two things quickly. One is just in direct answer, I, I mean whoever the, the entity that will pay for that Bluetooth scale is whatever entity has the incentive to either reduce utilization or improve outcomes, and if that scale makes it worthwhile. It is worth the upfront cost to uh, bend the cost curve or to produce better outcomes, depending. So whatever entity, whether it's the payer or the provider that is bearing that risk, is gonna want to make that investment. Um, one other point that's worth making is, um, as the providers become those risk takers, uh, they are becoming sort of ersatz insurance companies because they're taking on the risk of uh, higher than expected utilization. And in lots of states, not in, well, not in all states, but in lots of states, they don't have to have uh, the same uh, financial capital and other um, protections against the risks of, that are entailed in, in taking on that, that uh, utilization risk as a payer. So the, most of the regulation will go off who underwrote the policy as opposed to where the risk actually resides. And the trouble with that is whether some providers are gonna get themselves in a whole boatload of trouble by taking on more risk than they appreciate. 
So that was exactly where I was going with the next question, Peter. So I'm glad you teed that up. And I promise the audience, this is the last really wonky question before we get uh, we, before we close up, um, because it does, um, uh, Mark, um, beg the question: If providers are taking more risk and they're making more decisions uh, uh, related to where the money is spent, um, uh, providers don't have risk-based capital. Right. That's not that. That, that's a different industry than the providers right. have been in. What's the, uh, I mean, th that, has a, that has a fundamentally, um, if you look at it at the very highest conceptual level, it um, sort of undermines the idea of an insurance company to pass the risk to the providers. I mean, who, who's the insurance company? Well, who's well the first of all, we don't pass all the risk. We pass shared risk, whatever the system's willing to take, 50-50. We have one system that's taking 80% of it. But what we become is, a, is, is just a sophisticated version of a bank. Right? I mean, r really, managing risk-based capital is managing a bank. We take in money, we, you know, we lend it out to risk, mm -hmm. right? And then we, you know, work off of the float. And so the whole business really is banking. That's what insurance companies are, are banks. And, and our role should be that if the provider system was willing to manage the risk. We wouldn't need to do all this. I don't want to do all of it. You should be doing all of it. And if you did it all, then it would be about people keeping their doctor in their hospital, not keeping their insurance company. My brand shouldn't matter in the end analysis, it should be yours. Because you're making them healthier, more viable, and happier as a community. Then I can get out of the business of telling you what to do or telling them what to do. I, all I do is give them information, be your bank, support you when you make a mistake, get rewarded when you're successful, I mean, it's that simple. What he said. Did, did, I, just, <laughs> did I just hear the CEO of uh, the largest health insurance company in the United States? Not the largest. Not the largest. No, no. third largest. <laughs> third largest. Oh, We're apologies. working on that. <laughs> working on that, OK. <laughs> um, say that um, he's working to put himself sort of out of his current business? If you, if you were to look at, you didn't look at enough of my speeches on Google. Yeah. But in essence, that's what I've said. Yeah is that the insurance industry as it's structured today is because we have tried first by having you know, the providers do it. Then we had the insurance companies do it, HMOs, remember those? Mm -hmm. And then we had the employers try to do it by you know, setting premiums and doing cost sharing. It's, and at the end of it, it's the consumer and the, and the physician. That's the relationship that works. The consumer and the team, I should say. And so patient-centered medical homes where people are focused on the individual patient not teams focused on helping the doctor see the patient, which is how we're structured today in a lot of ways, is the best way to make the system work. Then we can help you with the financing. We can actually, we have access to the equity markets. We can help you with the financing of the capacity too. If, because once you figure this out, you're gonna realize you don't need the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh MRI. You don't need the 250 more hospital beds and the special tower. Um, you don't need a lot of the stuff you have because you're going to look at the capacity of the system and say, geez, when we keep people healthy, productive, viable, and happy, we're in a community where people are generally healthy, and when the, when the room's dark, that's a good day for us. That's the way it should be. Instead of when a siren pulls up, say, ah, oh, here comes the money. So you two are very optimistic. Mm -hmm. um, and I would like to close with asking you both, Give me three specific things that you see happening currently in the healthcare delivery, insurance, payment, design, mar place, market space that gives you optimism for the future. Three, so I would say uh, first that the low trend over the past few years does show that we can do this. Um, I'm particularly encouraged by the low trend in Medicare because that's less influenced by the business cycle. Last year, in 2014, Medicare spending was up 2.8% nominal. So you take out inflation, you take out beneficiary growth, real per person spending declined. Now there's been a little bit of an acceleration over the past few months, so something to watch, but it shows we can do it. Second is, I think the explosion in data analytics is very exciting. We are still early in that process. The valuations on all the companies that do that sort of thing are uh, skyrocketing, but I think that underscores the uh, value improvement that can come from uh, better integration of these disparate sources of data so that we can see things like where the available 
um, blood test is or the imaging is or what have you and integrate it all into an easier consumer uh, experience. And then the final thing is, I do think we're going to wind up with a different um, payment system in 2016, 2018, and 2020 than we had in 2010, 2008, and 2006. And we're going to have some twists and turns on the way and two steps forward, one step back, but we are going to continue making progress because not only is Medicare moving in that direction, but the private payers are also. And I think we're quickly getting to the point, we're not quite there yet, which is wh why I, I think further effort is necessary, but we're quickly going to get to the point where it becomes irreversible. And that's the key thing. We've got to make it irreversible because um, then once, you're, once, you're, once both feet are in the boat, then we're, then we're off. Um, and that's what I think really has to happen over the next couple of years. Terrific. All right. Um, I, you know, a lot of people will criticize the Affordable Care Act for some of its provisions, the way it was put together and how it was implemented. But in the end analysis, it was a burning platform and an action forcing event, which has caused people to talk to each other differently than they have in the past. Were it not for it and all the dialogue around it and all the fear around it, we wouldn't be having these kind of conversations. You know, we'd still be trying to figure out how to, how to keep the uh, nation afloat and what we could do with taxes. Um, so I think that has created a dialogue that's fundamentally different and we're having very rich dialogues with a lot of people around how the future should shape up. I think the second thing is, is that, and, you know, and, and um, I'll, I'll say this carefully, but 80% of all physician practices are now part of larger groups, institutions and larger groups. And that's a trend that says we're getting rid of the cottage industry part of this, which is really hard to control. And I think, um, and, and in a lot of cases, it's physicians who are running these larger organizations, which is a really good sign as well, because I think this in the end is really about people and taking better care of people. Um, so I think that's a real positive trend. And then I think the third is, is that we just don't have the money anymore. Um, you know, the next $10 trillion of debt will be 75% of Medicare and Medicaid, and if you throw Social Security in there, it's an even bigger number, it's over 100%. So we've got to do something. Um, otherwise, we'll all be working for the government. Uh, and, you know, I know that Peter spent some time there, but I'm not quite sure I want to do that. <laughs> um, so, I'm um, not sure I want to again either. <laughs> so I think, you know, the, the fact is, is that the numbers are so stark and so significant. And by the way, a lot of countries around the world are struggling with this in their own way because even their publicly funded systems are running out of money. Um, look at Europe, for, as a matter of fact. And so, if you, it, so everybody's got to struggle with this, this ultimately, how is it organized, how is it paid for, how do we, what, what do we value? Uh, and, and, and so far there aren't too many experiments except in a few homogenous countries like Denmark where it actually works really well. Well, I've learned a lot from this. I am so uh, uh, honored to have had uh, these two distinguished guests here. I would like all of you to join me in thanking them. <laughs>